Hello there, my fellow Mini Titan pilots, and welcome to another episode of lore covering the vaunted Imperial Knights. Since I haven't done a lore episode on these guys in a little while, I didn't want you to think that I was done with them. In fact, I have material for like 10 more videos at least. Today, since I've already talked about some of their ritual and heraldry, I wanted to expand a bit in that general direction and talk about a little more ritualistic stuff concerning the knights. This stuff will include the sacristans, a few words about the hows and whys of these people's obsession with honor, and the so-called ritual of becoming of an actual knight pilot. I am your usual host, the Knightly Narrator, and without further ado, let us learn more about the lifestyle of these noblemen, shall we? The first thing I wanted to talk to you about today are the so-called sacristans. Tech priests refer to the night world artificers that are inducted into the cult mechanicus as sacristans, and this quickly became what they were known as in the knightly houses too. Whenever a cargo ship arrives from a forge world to collect food or resources, it will also take a small party of apprentices from the night world. These apprentices are drawn from all levels of society, and could be the third son of a noble or the offspring of a local farmer. Over the course of their decade-long apprenticeship on the forge world, they are trained in the skills needed to maintain suits of knightly armor and then they return to their planet of origin as a fully trained sacristan. Unknown to the Imperial Knights, however, these trainees are also indoctrinated into the cult Mechanicus, providing a network of agents who can advance the interests of the Mechanicus. The local artificers that maintained the knight armor during the Age of Strife had already established themselves as a vitally important part of each knightly house and the training they have received from the Adeptus Mechanicus has only served to increase their status. From their first foundation, the sacristans quickly styled themselves as a priesthood for the half-forgotten mysteries of the technology that they knew, and as their power grew, the relationship between them and the knightly houses shifted and changed. Where in the past the technicians were seen as subjects or vassals, the sacristans soon began to speak with one voice, and by threatening to remove their services from any house that would not heed their advice, they soon became almost as influential in knightly society as the nobles themselves. In general, this has benefited the knightly houses for the sacristans act as something of a counterpart to the natural arrogance and warlike tendencies of the knights, and have often been able to arbitrate between different houses to ensure they don't wipe out each other in a bitter feud. However, this political might is also an important tool for the Adeptus Mechanicus, which the tech priests use to try and bend the night worlds to their will. More often than not, however, the knight's ingrained sense of honor and duty often drives them to follow a course of action that the Adeptus Mechanicus would far rather they ignore. Since the dark days of the Horus Heresy, the knight worlds have continued to establish themselves as an important and loyal part of the Imperium. Feared in battle, and almost unswayable once they have given a word, they are welcomed as powerful allies by Imperial commanders whenever they can use them. It is only the relative scarcity of the surviving night worlds and the rigid, hidebound society they have developed that limits the impact the Imperial Knights have on the galaxy. Daily life within the strongholds is bound by ancient tradition and ritual that can date back, unchanged, for more than 10,000 years, and which the Imperial Knights feel themselves honor-bound to adhere to. This immense awareness of tradition manifests itself in rituals which can dominate and suffocate all other aspects of life in that stronghold. Days are almost wholly consumed, tending to the obscure and esoteric tenets of tradition, and with honoring household traditions or important ancestors from thousands of years ago. For example, in House Hasberg, 
At the dawn of every day, the entire court gathers to hear the reading of the names and deeds of every ruler of the house, dating back to its foundation millennia before. There are hundreds of names, and the process takes up most of the day. Makes you wonder what they'll do when they can't fit all the reading in a single day. The only escape from the smothering ennui of courtly life lies in conflict. Both the heroic challenge of the field of battle as an imperial knight and the more ignoble but no less enthralling political contest, which can take place between the knightly houses. The first of these is the preserve of the first and second sons of the aristocracy, for only they are allowed to pilot suits of knight armor. It is difficult to imagine the sheer freedom and sense of power that donning a suit of armor brings to its wearer. At court, the noble's every move and action is dictated by ancient tradition and rigid social rules. Once the armor is donned, all that is forgotten. He is free to act as he sees fit, unconstrained by anything other than his own moral compass. This being the case, it comes as no surprise that Imperial Knights fight with such ruthlessness and joyful ferocity, or that they are willing to endlessly practice the techniques of battle such that their prowess is only matched by the Adeptus Astartes. When unable to justify wearing the armor for training or battle, nobles organize contests between themselves to prove who is the bravest and the most skilled. In truth, they are only content when arrayed for battle in their armor. However, there is also a darker side to the character of an Imperial Knight, one which drives another form of behavior that allows for an escape from the traditions and rituals of courtly life. The same mental conditioning that imposes a strong respect for hierarchy and fealty upon the nobles has a side effect of making them endlessly ambitious. In short, they are all compelled to outdo their peers and be acknowledged as the mightiest of them all. In part, this drives the noble's obsession with contests of skill, but it also reveals itself in an equally intense obsession with political intrigue. The courts of the knightly houses are riven with political factions, each one trying to outdo the other in any way possible. These political intrigues are not the sole purview of the nobles themselves. All nobles have a highborn consort, it being considered vital that a noble has sons to inherit their name and titles, and daughters to marry as consorts to other knightly families in order to cement political alliances. A noble's consort can have considerable influence, and political intrigue offers them just about their only escape from the drudgery of courtly life. Many a noble has risen to high power thanks to the intelligence, cunning and ruthlessness of the consort, while the noble himself has found his pleasures only on the field of battle. The result of all this is that plots and schemes abound. Often these will be inconsequential and only result in one faction or another getting prestige over their rivals. But, at times, such as when the ruler of a knightly house dies, this can become deadly serious. It is not unknown for factions to come to blows, or even to arrange the assassination of a particularly hated opponent. Most infamously, on the planet Patronus, a dispute about which rituals should be carried out when members of a different house visited escalated into a centuries-long conflict that devastated the planet and eventually led to the demise of both houses. The suits of knight armor are similar to titans, in that they are controlled through neural interface sockets surgically inserted into the noble pilot's cerebrum and cerebellum. The pilot sits in a control platform called a throne mechanicum, where umbilical interface cords are attached to his neural sockets. The throne mechanicum is then, in turn, plugged into the suit of knight armor, allowing the noble to control its movements as if it were a part of his own body, and to receive sensory feedback from the suit so that he can see what it sees and feel what it feels. This interface allows an imperial knight to move with a fluid grace, which can only be matched by the war machines of the Eldar. At the heart of every knightly stronghold is a single massive building known simply as the Sanctuary. 
It is here that the suits of knight armor are stored when not in use, and where the nobles undergo the ancient rituals and procedures that allow them to bond with their thrones mechanicum. These sanctuaries are incredibly ancient structures, built when the original human colony ships first landed on the night worlds during the Age of Technology. The essential functions of the sanctuaries also originate from that time, though the changes and modifications made to the equipment over the millennia means it would be unrecognizable to those who first installed it. It is in the sanctuary that young nobles undergo the bonding process that imprints their personality into the throne mechanicum in a procedure known as the ritual of becoming. This process takes place in a special room known as the Chamber of Echoes. The imprinting process is a lengthy and sometimes dangerous business. It has become a rite of passage for young nobles, the process of leaving behind their childhood once and for all. When he is old enough, a son of the household who is designated to become a noble is fitted with the secret neural sockets and then undertakes a vigil, remaining seated in the throne mechanicum that has been assigned to him throughout a long night in the Chamber of Echoes. The nature of this ordeal and the inherent dangers associated with the neural interfacing process means that more than a tenth of all supplicants are either driven mad by the process or suffer fatal aneurysms brought about by neurological feedback. Assuming it is successful, the imprinting process has two important side effects. Firstly, the imprint tends to exaggerate dominant aspects of the young noble's personality especially with regard to the emotions he is feeling during the vigil. If he is scared, the imprint on the throne will always be of a nervous tendency, making the suit difficult to control in battle. If the noble is angry with someone, the imprint will always loathe that person, even if the noble himself has long forgotten or forgiven them. When a noble dies, a throne mechanicum retains some of his character. And these ghosts whisper to each supplicant through the long vigil in the Chamber of Echoes. However, in addition to imprinting the noble's personality upon the throne mechanicum, the mindlink technology directly affects the personality of the noble himself. It does this by implanting strong positive association to notions of fealty, obligation and hierarchy, as well as a deep respect for the noble's ancestors. Exactly why and how these things are made to happen is something of a mystery, but it seems most likely that the mind-altering feedback routines were intentionally included by the device original designers, to limit the potential of a noble to go rogue and turn on the people he was meant to protect. Once a throne mechanicum has been imprinted, it is stored in the communion dome, which lies atop each sanctuary. This chamber is large and circular, with walls that are lined with all the thrones mechanicum of the household's nobles. When a noble wishes to interface with his suit of knight armor, he sits upon the throne and instigates the protocols of joining. The umbilical cords attach themselves to the noble's neural sockets, and then a section of wall behind the throne yawns open. The throne mechanicum slides backwards and descends from the communion dome through a series of transport tunnels before finally sliding into the waiting cockpit of the noble's suit of knight armor. This final step in the process takes place in a massive hangar known as the Vault Transcendent, which forms the ground floor of the sanctuary. This huge hole is large enough to hold all the stronghold's knights. As soon as the noble, throne and knight armor are united, the three become one, and the imperial knight powers into life. Vast doors open in the outer walls of the sanctuary, and the knight strides forth into battle. And this, my friends, has been what I wanted to tell you about imperial knights and their rituals for today. For those of you curious, my future night videos will include another video about their war gear, the ranks and formations from the Great Crusade and the present, and what are the Free Blade Knights. If you got any thoughts on today's topic, always feel free to write them down in the comments below. Was this video enjoyable or informative? 
In that case, please consider clicking the like button and subscribing for future content. I thank you kindly for watching, and I will see you next time. The Emperor Protects.